Headline Humboldt, we speak with two attorneys from Legal Services of Northern California about their efforts to help the homeless navigate a cryptic and confusing legal system that often ignores real economic injustice. Also, a new plan to help inmates find healthy and productive lives after incarceration moves forward as Humboldt County looks for developers to build a new re-entry resource center. Coming up now on Headline Humboldt. From the top of Humboldt Hill, this is Headline Humboldt. I'm James Falk. Thanks for joining us. Two of our contributors were honored this week for stories they've shared with us here on Headline Humboldt. Linda Stansberry and Ryan Hudson were both honored by the Humboldt Journalism Project. Stansberry won outright for her story, Profit and Pain, a North Coast Journal article about a nursing home chain that paid millions to its affiliated companies, all while failing to provide required care. She brought this topic to our show and its ongoing segment, What's Wrong with Humboldt and How to Fix It. Ryan Hudson, meanwhile, of the Redheaded Black Belt News blog and a frequent Headline Humboldt contributor, was recognized for her article, Which Bad Decision Do You Make? Green Belt Sweep in Eureka Displaces Dozens, Removes Tons of Trash. According to the Humboldt Journalism Project, her work stood out for capturing a wide range of views about the removal of camps from an area green belt and the broader issues surrounding homelessness. I mention these awards because we're proud to be associated with fine reporters, obviously, but also because we are today following up on Ryan Hudson's story, Tense Trash and Trauma, by interviewing two staunch defenders of the homeless from Legal Services of Northern California. But before we get to that conversation, let's hear a new update from Ryan Hudson on the state of things as of earlier this week. In a follow-up to Tense Trash and Trauma in Eureka coverage, a few things have happened, but not much has changed. In the midst of piles of personal belongings, tarps, tents, and clothing, people who were ousted from the bushes adjacent from the FedEx building in northern Eureka had nowhere to go. One woman, who did not want to be interviewed on camera, said that she was still on the waiting list with a program assisted by the city of Eureka called Uplift. In the meantime, she and others were waiting it out in the Greenbelt area at the north end of Eureka, only a sidewalk away from Highway 101. Documenting again that this mess is still here and that it is indeed the same trash. In regard to property stewardship on that block, Eureka City Manager Miles Slattery explained that it was a network of property ownership and that in the privately owned Greenbelt area where trash removal occurred in September of 2022, there were five separate parcels. Those parcels are owned by four separate property owners and according to Slattery, each of those property owners were noticed about the need to abate accumulated rubbish and debris. The most recent point in time count found that Eureka, within its city boundaries, has at least 498 individuals identified as homeless and that roughly 80% of them were considered chronically unsheltered. Crystal is one of these people. Crystal lives with Rico and a tent mate out in the marsh, north of Eureka, not far from Open Door Clinic and not far from the Salvation Army building. She took me with her one day to go back to get some water in a jug that she uses to fill at a nearby gas station almost daily. Follow-ups on tents, trash, and trauma in Eureka coverage will include updates about Crystal and Rico and services provided or not provided for people on the fringes of the housing crisis in Eureka and Humboldt County. Reporting for Headline Humboldt, this is Ryan Hudson. Okay, attorneys Rebecca Smith and Rebecca Buckley-Stein from Legal Services of Northern California, thanks for joining us. Thank you. Um, so um, you guys gave a recent workshop on homelessness. Can you describe what that event was about and what it was, did you guys accomplish what you hope to accomplish? 
Yeah, so we were um, invited uh, to participate in that event with, um, from two other organizations, AHA and HEAL. Mm -hmm. um, and so we were really, um, th th they really organized the event. Um, and we just showed up to um, try to give some know your rights information um, that yeah. is particularly relevant to um, homeless folks and answer questions and also just kind of spread the word about the services that we can provide in the community and the issues that um, we can help folks with. And it was really successful. There's a lot of people there and um, good conversation and good questions. So Legal Services of Northern California, can you explain to us what the organization is and what its mission uh, yeah. entails? Yeah, I have our mission right here. Legal <laughs> uh, our mission is to provide uh, quality legal services to empower the poor to identify and defeat the causes and effects of poverty within our community. Mm -hmm. um, and so the Eureka Office, we um, provide free legal services to um, individuals in Humboldt, Del Norte, and Trinity County. Um, Rebecca and I are the, the two attorneys in that office. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, we practice, um, a, a large majority of our cases are housing cases. Um, and then we also can uh, do public benefits issues, um, social security issues, disability, civil rights issues, um, and health issues. Wow. And education. Yeah. Uh, now, as attorneys, you guys are, you know, obviously, um, you know, you deal with the intricacies of, of the law and the system as a whole. I mean, can you describe for us from your perspective how um, there's an unfairness there economically um, with people who are suffering either just on the low end of the economic scale or are homeless? How does that impact people? So I think that um, when someone doesn't have financial resources to hire a private attorney, that obviously is a net barrier for that person Absolutely. to engage with the legal system. Um, but even outside of the issue of hiring attorney and affording attorney, um, some of the barriers are pretty built into the system. Mm -hmm. So for example, in the context of evictions, um, once a person is served with an eviction lawsuit, um, the tenant only has five days to respond to that eviction lawsuit. And Legally? Yes. Like in terms of filing an objection to it or something? Yes. And so you can imagine that um, if a person can't afford an attorney, um, doesn't know exactly how to respond because it's not very easy to figure that out, um, but maybe also has additional barriers like may not have transportation, maybe they work three jobs and don't have time off when the court is open. Um, that responding within a five-day time period is really prohibitive for, for most low-income and, and working families. And what happens um, when an individual is not able to respond within that five days is that something called a default judgment is entered against the tenant. Mm -hmm. And essentially what that means is um, the tenant loses the eviction automatically, they are evicted, and they've never had their opportunity to tell their story to the court. Mm -hmm. So while the legal system does not have um, intrinsically legal documents or processes that say if you are poor, you will be discriminated against, yeah. the way that the system operates is very difficult for people to navigate without an attorney. There's also the issue of just even like literacy with some of this stuff, right? Like, I mean, a lot of people I know and from my childhood and, you know, my extended, uh, you know, uh, friendships or whatever, they don't even realize that there is an option to go. It's like if the landlord says get out, I have to get out or they're going to call the cops. It's basically kind of the logic that uh, follows a, a lot of the time. And there is um, some truth to that. Uh, so, like, know your rights, I imagine, is, is an important part of people's battle in that regard, to know what people can do and not, right? Yeah, absolutely. Even just um, uh, spread it, spreading the word that um, um, there there is some assistance available, um, either, you know, through our office, we, we encourage um, any, anyone that thinks that they might have a legal problem to call, because if we can't help, then hopefully we can at least refer or point someone in the right direction. Um, and in an eviction, you get a summons from the court. It's more um, apparent that there's uh, that you might want to contact a lawyer. There's the process. Yeah, yeah, but there's a lot of issues that um, it, you know particularly impact um, those living in poverty, um, where it's not so obvious um, mm -hmm. in, in the context of healthcare, education, public benefits. Um, but if you if you are able to access an attorney, sometimes we can make a big difference um, in uh, in those cases as well. Yeah, absolutely. Um, one of the things that's made this whole thing really complicated is that there are laws on the books, especially in Eureka, um, the no camping ordinance or, I mean, things like it basically, basically makes it illegal to fall asleep in the city of Eureka if you don't have a home. 
Um, I mean, how do you, uh, do you guys chart those kinds of things and do any advocacy for seeing those laws changed or is that not part of your remit? So we are um, actively engaged and involved in understanding what our local community is doing regarding the homelessness issue that we have. Yeah. Um, and um, just to clarify that there is um, a recent court decision um, called the Boise decision, that's what we typically call it. Um, and, it and that decision essentially says that um, we cannot criminalize people for simply existing outside if yeah. there are no available shelter options for that person. There's nowhere for that person to go. It's um, unlawful to then criminalize them for simply existing in the community. Mm -hmm. um, the, we are actively following the camping ordinances at the city of Eureka, and we're, we're making sure to engage with that process. Um, the legal process is slower than we all would like it to be. Um, so I think that um, as we continue as a community to deal with the issue of homelessness, it's very important to understand that um, no human being can be criminalized or punished for simply existing when there's nowhere else for them to go. Does that, does that happen though? I mean, it's like the, the, the Boise decision says it shouldn't, but has that happened in the past, or is that something that... I think that the way that we like to think about it is, um, so the Boise versus Martin decision is very, or Martin versus Boise is a, um, uh, is a is a is really a, f a, a floor level protection. Sure. It says yeah, yeah. you can't criminalize. It's it's an Eighth Amendment case, so it's about not being able to criminalize people for uh, like a status crime, just existing without somewhere to go. Sure. Yeah. Um, but we would encourage and implore cities, counties, everywhere, everyone um, to really think far beyond that. Not just complying with the law, which obviously the city is required to do because um, that's just a legal requirement to comply with that case. Yeah. Um, but really we should be thinking about going far beyond that in um, finding ways to house people um, that is sustainable and um, suitable and really like the appropriate housing for um, all income levels. Yeah, absolutely. One of the things that is interesting about this ongoing story with Ryan is the, the SLU area and how it sort of touches a lot of different property owners and it's also in different jurisdictions. How much responsibility does a landowner have in that circumstance? If someone owns property that someone else decides to make a camp uh, I mean, from an individual perspective, is there some responsibility on the part of the landowner that they have to help address that? Or if it's an institution like the Humboldt County Office of Education, do they have a different level of responsibility? How do you guys think of that? So I think that um, we can't really give legal analysis on sure. very specific particular yes. hypotheticals, but what we can say is that um, as a community in general, we all have a responsibility, one, to comply with the law, obviously, and two, um, we have a responsibility to look at the issue of homelessness in a holistic manner. And so um, it's important for community members to engage with the process, whether that's um, participating in their local government, public meetings, um, interviewing and, and engaging with homeless individuals in, and, and finding out exactly what they need. Um, in the state of California, we do have a requirement that is applied to many public services related to housing that it's a model called Housing First. I was going to ask um, about that. Actually. And, and Housing First essentially says that in order to help individuals build out of poverty and come into stable environments where they can really flourish instead of just simply surviving, um, the first thing we need to provide people is stable housing. Sure. And so I think as a community, we really do need to solve this issue of housing and it really needs to be the first thing that we um, grapple with. I remember hearing that Salt Lake City had uh, deployed the Housing First program and had a lot of success. Have you heard of that or am I just talking out my nose? So um, I have not heard of Salt Lake City's particular Housing First program, okay. but I do know in, in the state of California, we do have Housing First as our model and, okay. um, and it has not been perfect, um, but part of the, the 
solution um, to homelessness and, and lack of housing is to expand services. So housing first, just in the same way that Boise is a floor that we mm -hmm. cannot criminalize people for simply existing. Housing first is a nice floor, but we want to rise up to the ceiling. And we think that here in Humboldt County, that we as a community can really wrap around and, and provide the necessary services if we all engage um, together. Are there any particular reforms or changes that you would like to see implemented? I mean, you mentioned housing first as a, you know, um, a theoretical, but what, uh, are you calling on the city to do anything different than they're doing right now or the county or? Um, so I think what we could say is what some other places are doing sure. that, uh, that seems to be um, options that um, are, are successful. So um, there's tenant protect, so, you know, this is a little, um, away from homelessness, a few of these things. Um, but it's all kind of, It's all know? connected, yeah. 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 I mean, uh, uh, the lack of affordable housing is the, you know, I think the cause of homelessness in a lot of ways. Sure. Um, so, for example, um, local local city, there's there's options to implement um, uh, more stringent uh, renter protections mm -hmm. um, that apply to more t properties, things like just cause ordinances or, um, you know, rent control ordinances, rent stabilization. Um, there's also land use options that um, can be implemented and are often successful, including like inclusionary zoning, which me is you, generally um, there's different models for that, but um, basically it, um, it is a mandate by um, for, for a certain number of new construction to um, plan for and designate a um, certain number of homes or um, units for um, various income levels. So it's it's most important generally for the low, very low, and extremely low income. Um, individuals because those are folks that would otherwise be completely excluded from housing because they can't, you know, um, afford it generally. Yeah. Um, so those are some, like, just off the top of my head that other places do. There's also, you know, some states have implemented right to counsel rules and eviction um, court, which helps um, to make sure you at least have some access to a lawyer. Um, so this is just kind of an array of different sure. examples. Um, yeah. We're not... Um, we're not uh, advocating for any of those specific things right now, um, but those are options available to um, to our state and to local governments. Um, from a you know from your perspective, how do you think the city handled this whole removal thing in that in that green space? Do you uh, think that it was handled fairly, or were there steps that they should have taken that they didn't? I know that some of the people who lived out there lost some belongings. That was stuff that was going to, and now they don't really have a recourse to get some of that back. Do you feel like? that could have been handled better? What criticisms do you have, I guess it is? So I would say, obviously, um, people have a right to their possessions, and when possessions are removed from a, a public space, there has to be notice and there has to be the uh, opportunity to reclaim those possessions. So um, that needed to be followed. Um, and I think that um, if, if we're talking about um, the displacement of homeless communities or unhoused communities from one place to another place to another place, that is um, going to continue to happen until we build the appropriate infrastructure that has affordable housing for low income and very low income individuals and has the appropriate supports to maintain that housing as a long term viable um, housing option for individuals. And I think something that will continue to occur until we really um, deal with the issue is that simply um, offering someone an apartment or a place to live sometimes is not adequate enough. Mm -hmm. um, we see a lot of evictions of very low income people for very minor offenses um, that in, in my mind, while it may be legally permissible to remove someone for something that is a small offense, really it should not be happening that if you have a mental health issue and somehow your behavior is a manifestation, maybe you're having a panic attack or something like that and it's disruptive to the neighbors, removing that person from the one stable place that they have mm -hmm. is not going to be a long-term sustainable solution to the issue of homelessness. Yeah, that's related to another question that occurred to me a few moments ago that as you were talking, the complexity of this, it's not just homelessness or the economic issue of not having enough money to be able to afford a home, but it's tied up with mental health services, it's tied up with uh, like jail reform mm -hmm. and incarceration issues and how we've sort of funneled our homeless and our mentally ill into the jails. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, it seems like 
if we're going to address this in a piecemeal way, it, it may always be doomed for failure. So uh, that seems like a, a yawning task, a chasm of like, what do we do? <laughs> so I think the answer to that question is yes, of course it can be very overwhelming because really we're talking about um, a system change that is monumental. In order to deal with homelessness, we do need mental health services. We do need um, alcohol and drug treatment. Absolutely. We uh, All of these things we need. Yeah. But we have to start somewhere, Absolutely. right? And so I think that um, the community of Humboldt is trying, and there are a lot of amazing organizations locally who, who are really engaging with this process. The municipal governments are engaging with this process, and so starting somewhere is always a good place. We have to start somewhere, exactly right? Exactly right, yeah. You can't bail out the, yep. the boat with uh, no cups of water. That's <laughs> right, that's right. Um, also, you guys are, um, you mentioned your work on affordable housing and how it's sort of tangentially related to this. You guys are doing a, a tenants union in Arcata. Um, uh, yeah, so can you talk um, about what that is? And then we'll yeah, so it's, a, it's another event where um, we can't take too much credit for it. We were uh, mostly <laughs> just invited um, to um, uh, distribute and present some Know Your Rights information about uh, tenant protections t um, by this uh, tenants union group that's being formed. So um, it's a um, it, it'll be a Know Your Rights event. We'll be available to give um, some general legal information and then answer questions to folks and also explain the services that we can offer and do some outreach about um, about that. But uh, this is obviously t a tenant specific. Um, that's on March nineteenth, mm -hmm. which is a Sunday at um, one at the Bayside Grange. And uh, lastly, I mean, we have about two minutes left. Um, you know, how do we, how do people in their ordinary lives, if they want to help and make a difference, I mean, what, there's a lot of different needs to address, and people have limited, you know, bank accounts and whatnot, but if they had to put their attention to one particular aspect of this that could make something move, where would you suggest? How should an ordinary people get involved in this issue? So I would, I always like to say, start with, what your strengths are. So if you are naturally gifted in music, mm -hmm. um, engaging, using the skills and the talents that you have and, and lending that to um, the process is really where it's best to start. Um, we're lawyers, we're trained as lawyers, we engage with the issue of homelessness through the legal system, but there are a lot of services and needs that people have. So um, if you have a particular skill and you would like to lend that skill towards the cause of um, making the community better, I think that's where most people can start. Yeah, I also just would chime in that even just thinking about who, who your community is and thinking about the community more broadly, um, and kind of uh, sharing in, in the problem, taking responsibility for the problem, um, and engaging with, with the work that's being done um, in government and nonprofits um, to address it. Um, because it's it's the community has a responsibility for this. This isn't there's there's no point there's no pointing fingers here, um, and uh, we should all be engaging. We should all care, and we should all be um, you know um, concerned about this issue. Yeah, and I mean as we were as mentioned earlier before the show, the pressures aren't going away. I mean with seven thousand more students coming to HSU, that's seven thousand potentially more renters coming in, more demand. Um, it's going to be with us for a while. This affordability crisis. Yeah. Yes, it is. Thank you guys for joining us. I thank appreciate you. it. Thank you. And we'll have to thank have you back you. on the show. I'd yeah. love to talk to you more. Yes, thank you so much. Yep. We'll be right back after this short break. Hi, I'm Tracy Barnes Priestley. This week on What's on Your Bucket List, we take to the water with our truly adventurous guests as she tries something that has always intrigued her. After that, an inquisitive woman tries her hand at a colorful pursuit that will take us up, up, and away. What's on your bucket list? Thursday at 7.30 on Keat HD. Friends and supporters of Keat TV, we are calling all who have a passion for public television on the North Coast. Keat is looking for a diverse group of people to join its Community Advisory Board, or CAB, CAP members play an advising role to management and act as Keats ambassadors within the community. Meetings are held quarterly on Zoom. Go to Keats.org, find the link for CAB, and get involved today. We look forward to meeting you. In an effort to reduce recidivism and help former inmates build better lives, Humboldt County this week invited developers to bid on building a re-entry resource center attached to the existing jail. In this parking lot, the state will fund 
more than two-thirds of the $28 million project. As soon as 2025, the center will house up to 44 low-risk inmates and will offer counseling along with mental health and substance abuse treatment services. There should be no wasted days in custody. You should always be working forward to coming back into the community, to making yourself a more successful version of yourself. We don't have the space for those people to really do that right now. We already have a lot of staff at the Day Reporting Center, and this will allow them to work, engage with the people in the facility at an earlier time, and they'll be able to transition just smoothly back into the community. Today I come to you as a tenant uh, that has just been served a notice of eviction. In 60 days I'm looking at being homeless. This is the origin story for a new tenants union, the one we mentioned before. As part of a plan to remodel these apartments near Westwood, Murphy's, and Arcata, Strombeck Properties issued Raylena Crixton a no-fault eviction. Crixton is now fighting back. The biggest thing a uh, tenants union offers is legal representation, but also um, information, community events, organization, and um, essentially a, a positive influence on city council, on city policy, countywide policy. You only have three entities which control the majority of multi-tenant units in Arcata. Strongbeck Properties, Danco, and Kramer. The time is now to ensure that renters aren't steamrolled as we grow as a community. Number one would be to put a stop to no-fault evictions. Uh, currently that's one of the few loopholes that landlords can utilize uh, in order to evict tenants totally at the whim of the landlord and you have 60 days to vacate. Largely it's a way that they can reset rents and get around any um, protections that tenants currently have in terms of how much your rent can go up within a single year if you're an established tenant. Currently, the compensation is only one month of your current rent. What we would want to see is three months or four months of market rate rent paid to tenants if they are given an eviction notice. You can pay for moving expenses, you can actually get a place, and the psychological weight of being evicted is a little bit more alleviated. Critics traditionally argue such measures could backfire. Poor people could theoretically be priced out of housing, for example, if developers demand higher move-in deposits to cover higher eviction costs. Similarly, rent control could reduce housing construction because smaller profits from less rent revenue will attract fewer developers. Right now in Arcata, a median one-bedroom apartment rents for $1,300 a month, a two-bedroom for $1,450. The goal of the tenants' union, in part, is to lower those prices. On March 19th, we'll be having our first community meeting, which is a Know Your Rights meeting hosted in partnership by the Legal Services of Northern California. Also, you can go to RentersUnitedHumboldt.com and find out a little bit more information. The point of this is to make sure that people are educated, they're informed, and they know that they're not alone. When people are informed, they're empowered. Raylena Crixton unsuccessfully ran for Arcata City Council in the fall. She's unsure if she'll run again. That's all our time for this evening. Thanks for watching, and we look forward to seeing you here next week. Stay tuned. Stay informed.